okay so I got some uh, great comments here some great questions that I want to go over sort of do a follow-up on this uh, seven-year tribulation fairy tale that's not in the Bible but first of all let me um, share this video with you from voice of believers he's uh, somebody I subscribe to he does excellent presentations um, very smart guy but regarding this particular topic he's wrong and what he's gonna claim is the tribulation is God's wrath and I'm telling you it's not there's nothing in the Bible at all whatsoever that suggests or implies that God's wrath is tribulation or tribulation is God's wrath these are different terms meaning different things but we let's be fair. Let's let him speak, okay? He that believed on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believed not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abide on him. Okay, first of all, notice the title up here, the tribulation is God's wrath, and then he points to a verse that speaks about God's wrath, no mention of tribulation. If you don't take the umbrella of salvation like Moses was speaking of in uh, uh, Psalm 91 the wrath is gonna be on you well when is it gonna be on you there is gonna be a thing called tribulation and the tribulation is nothing else but he says the tribulation is nothing else but God's wrath but that's not in the Bible anywhere and I'm gonna show that God's wrath because God is gonna take away that umbrella and whatever he took here is going now okay so he's talking about the umbrella of salvation and Psalm 91 uh, Moses umbrella of salvation I I have to confess I don't know uh, how he sees that in Psalm 91 nevertheless it's going to be poured out including what happened in the in the past on this day we're going to see this in revelation chapter 14 in verse 10 the same shall drink of the wine the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation okay again talking about the wrath of god not talking about tribulation these are two different things of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation so when the Bible speaks in Proverbs 23 don't look at the wine how it how it sits there and red and fine and looking good it's gonna it's gonna destroy you it's a picture of the wrath of God okay all right so I don't want to cover the Proverbs and the Psalms just because I, I'm not seeing the connection he does you can do a your own study and do the comparison but neither place makes any reference to this idea that God's wrath is tribulation nor does it suggest tribulation is God's wrath so I want to share um, a couple of things here I'm not sure exactly where I want to start here so I'm can I'm looking at this and I'm thinking man you know what why are so many people saying tribulation is God's wrath so how do we pinpoint and be specific and exact about this well we've got to start with the definition all right and the Bible defines its own words so we're gonna get to that but let's uh, take a look at the definitions or the word tribulation as defined in 1828 and it states severe affliction distresses of life vexations in scripture it often denotes the troubles and distresses which proceed from persecution all right and then it gives two examples Matthew 13 and John 16 all right and you see the evolving and that sort of thing um, changing throughout um, you know what do we got here 85 years or whatever it is um, 1913 that which 
occasions distress, trouble, or vexation, severe affliction. And again, it gives uh, two examples, Matthew 13 and John 16. All right, so that's it. And it's really not complicated, right? Uh, let's see, severe affliction, distresses of life, vexation, and scripture denotes troubles and distresses which proceed from persecution. Uh, the one example in, in Matthew 13, do I got that up already? All right. Um, I guess we could start here. Um, yet has he not root in himself, but doeth for a look for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Now this is the parable of the seed. Um, well, where are we at here? Do I, no, it's all the way up here. So he gives the parable, then he explains the parable, right? What is what is this here? Okay, parables right there. Saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and then he explains the parable, right? And so that's what this, the context of this is about. And in the context of the parable, this is not the wrath of God. It's basically saying that, well, he hears the word of God, but then the world troubles him. And he's offended because of it. Because there's no root. He's not rooted in the word of God. He's not rooted in the spirit of God. He's not rooted in eternal life. And therefore, the world... Uh, dissuades him, uh, per persuades him uh, to go after the world rather than the Word of God. Okay. All right. And there's another example given. Okay. Nothing at all about the wrath of God or the end of the world. This is while you're alive in this world, in this wicked world. John third or John sixteen. Again, in the world you shall have tribulation. And the word, oh, where's this at? The word tribulation again is mentioned. I think. Where am I at here? Oh, goodness, I forgot. There, it's the very last one. Nice, okay. <laughs> These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right there, it's not talking about the wrath of God. It's talking about in this life, in this world, you're going to have tribulations and persecutions and you will suffer many things because you are not of the world and the enemy of the world seeks to trouble you this world is troubled right now uh, so let's do a word search okay uh, suffer many thing all right, and you will notice uh, nine verses with those three words. And uh, so let's go over them real quick here. Suffer many things and suffer many things of the elders and chiefs, chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Talking about Jesus will suffer many things. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Okay, so talking, uh, the, this woman's talking about, if I remember right. Yeah, his wife sent unto him, saying, Having thou nothing to do with that just man, Jesus being that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream. She suffered many things and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all talking about. I don't know if it was the, the girl there or not. Uh, 
nevertheless. Uh, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. This is tribulation, persecution. This is suffering many things in this world, in this life. And Jesus provides us a way out. Okay. And he answered and told them, Eli Elias, Elijah, and verily come first and restore all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said it not. And Luke, uh, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Have ye suffered many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? All right, so let's go to that one. Oh, let's read a little bit. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. All right, so, um, so they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. All right, so um, we're going to suffer many things. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now Jesus suffered many things and no servant is greater than his master. All right, so if our master suffered many things and went through tribulation, so also will we go through tribulation. All right. Jesus said it plainly in John 16, In the world you shall have tribulation. He's not talking about you're going to have the wrath of God. That's not the same. It's not the same thing at all. All right. Now, we go to, oops, we'll go to Matthew 24, and we read very clearly, very plainly, very simply that there will be a great tribulation right there and except those days be shortened there should no flesh be saved so just by those two verses alone we know that people are going to be get getting saved during this quote unquote great tribulation Except those days be short, and there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay, so the only way for anybody to claim that the great tribulation is the wrath of God is to one say that saved people will have to go through the wrath of God. That's the only way. And then the other claim that I see a lot of people making is that there are two resurrections, but there's only one. It's on the great day of the Lord. It's on at the end of the world. And we see that here in verse 31, when the angels of God gathers together his elect. We go back here to 21, or 22, excuse me. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay, for the elect, for the elect's sake, which are gathered together at the end of the world, at the great sound of a trumpet, those days shall be shortened. And it's interesting also, if that wasn't enough, immediately after the tribulation. Now, there's a... <laughs> this is so obvious, but... For whatever reason, people are super confused about this. Now, look, if 
this was the wrath of God and then after the wrath of God the angels gather together the elect that could only mean that the elect had to endure the wrath of God they had to go through it it makes no sense you actually hear these the pre-tribulation people say that they're not gonna go through the wrath of God and that makes no sense at all it's not here in Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or Luke 21 there's so if this is the wrath of God where's the gathering together of the elect you therefore have to say there's two gathering togethers of the elect and the first one's not mentioned anywhere Jesus forgot to mention it or either that Jesus didn't understand it's one of the two or you could say he's just a liar and didn't mention it on purpose he's deceiving I mean what other options are there really there's no possible way to honestly reconcile that belief system of a pre-tribulation or the idea that tribulation is the wrath of God it's not making any sense at all the only way that I can see that people teach this that the tribulation is the wrath of God the only way is if they're getting it from a false teacher because it's not in the Bible they heard somebody else maybe it was their dad grandpa or the the preacher when they were growing up or I don't know what maybe their buddy I, it, but they're not getting it from the Bible and so you hear people say oh you got to go to church you got to go to church you got to go to church well what happens when people go to the to church they listen to their preacher and they stop reading their Bible there's a couple of ways to look at this if your preacher is preaching a false gospel and false doctrines and doctrines of devils and so on and so forth what good is it it's no good at all so again this idea of a tribulation being the same as God's wrath is not in the Bible anywhere therefore I have to conclude they only get it from false teachers and boy oh boy isn't it interesting if you actually go back to the beginning of Matthew 24 when the disciples ask him what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world what's the very first thing Jesus says Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Isn't that interesting? Take heed that no man deceive you. They shall deceive many, and uh, you shall be afflicted and shall kill you if that's not great tribulation. Uh, if that's not distress and persecution uh, right there false prophets shall rise and deceive many and this is warning after warning of deceivers right false Christ false prophets shall deceive the very elect okay it's interesting and what do we see in the world today? Just incredible, incredible deception. And I'm not saying this guy's doing it intentionally. I don't think anybody's doing it intentionally. This is just a result of people not trusting the Bible that they hold in their hands and rather trusting other people and what they teach. But if you actually read the Bible and believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, you see there is no 
correlate, no direct correlation between Great Tribulation and the wrath of God. None at all. In fact, it the I hold the idea goes against what Jesus teaches. In the world, ye shall ha have tribulation. You can't reconcile that with the wrath of God. You can't. There's no I I can't show you a verse that says, well, here tr is tribulation, which means the wrath of God, because there is none. Nothing at all. All right. So let's go over these uh, comments here uh, in regards to the seven-year tribulation fairy tale. All right, I'll, go, I'll start at the beginning here. And Scott Merrill says, Neither is mentioned a rapture. All right, so let's see here. The, they, you know, I've heard people say that. The rapture is not in the Bible. All right, let's read Matthew 24, verse 31. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. All right, so gather together the elect. Well, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. We need something more concrete than that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed that's not good enough for you all right let's keep going we can go to uh, first corinthians 15 no that's not it but now is christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept so if Christ rose from the dead, so also will we, through him and in him, raise from the dead. He will raise us from the dead. All right, First Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. If that's not enough for you, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. I really don't. The rapture doesn't exist. Well, if you're not part of it, buddy, you're in big trouble. Big, big, big trouble. All right. But I appreciate the comment. Uh, and uh, what did I not read the rest of it? I apologize. Although, if the electromagnetic force that is pushing everything down from above stops, gets turned off, people and objects may start to float in the air until the force starts again. Now, may the force be with you. So, I mean, how do I say this? Back in the day, I used to smoke a lot of marijuana, and I could, maybe back then, when I was 14 years old, I might be able to understand that. I don't understand it now. I'm an old man. I'm an old man. I don't know what he's talking about. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Right there is your force. All right, because you got heaven, the air, and you got earth, the solid. Therefore, there must be gravity. There must be this force. Where did the force come from? God. Without it, there is no earth. The whole earth just sort of goes up in the air. There's nothing. You really don't have your foot on the ground. You don't have anything at all. I don't believe in this fantasy, fairy tale, science fiction idea, whatever you want to call it, of of uh, no gravity all right in the beginning God created the it just a, from a logical standpoint you have to have in order to have an earth you have to have this force that keeps the earth together without it there is no heaven and earth all right and there's always going to be a heaven and earth uh, do I have to 
go through all that. Uh, the fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. There's no possible way for this idea that uh, there's no longer going to be a heaven and earth. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, but the earth is not going to be, you know, broken apart and then you don't have nothing. You don't have either. You don't have heaven and you don't have earth. Okay. So, I mean, this is just a silly, nonsensical argument or discussion, whatever you want to call it. I don't care for it. I really don't. You want to make a big doubt, big deal out of nothing? Uh, that's you, that's on you, buddy. Uh, to me, it's vain. It's a waste of time. Doesn't mean nothing. Does you no good at all, in my opinion. Nevertheless, appreciate the comment, Scott. Uh, I'm I have no doubt somebody will find that interesting. Okay, so RC says Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Not saying I agree with dispensationalism, because I don't. How do you reconcile this this scripture then? All right, so I guess in order to explain it, I guess we'd have to go and um, define dispensationalism. Okay, so the this idea now this idea of dispensationalism comes in many forms. All right when there's no truth attached to it it can be spread out in several different ways and you take a look at mormonism um, to me is the most insane um, doctrine if you will of dispensationalism it's so crazy mind-bogglingly stupid if you ask me i mean it's just beyond stupid all right so Mormonism, Mormons dispensationalism is this idea that Jesus Christ is was at one time just like uh, you and I, but on a different planet. And then him and his brother Satan came here, and now, uh, I don't know. Well, we got to believe in Joseph Smith, uh, a 19-year-old pervert that had... Uh, sex with a lot of women, uh, including underage women, and married a lot of women. So we got to trust in Him, and then if we trust in Him, we're going to be the Jesus Christ of our own planet. And if you don't, but you're a Christian, then you come back and you get another try. However, if you're not either, you come back as a black man and you're cursed so you don't want to do that if you know if you're a mormon god forbid i mean that's what they teach you can't you can't argue against that because that's what they teach uh that's their idea of dispensationalism now they'll tell you okay to go backwards all right so uh, you know, you got Moses and all that, those people, and then Jesus came along, and then what Jesus taught was, it just sort of faded out, and so now we need another prophet, and, um, you know, using that logic, uh, what, what he teaches us is going to fade out too, right? But they don't, you know, when you're 14-year-old snot-nosed kid, and you're going around witnessing to everybody, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, you're trying to echo what they taught you what they brainwash you to, to believe and Mormonism is a cult but uh, again this is the extreme form of dispensationalism all right where there are different dispensations different periods and so they'll tell you you can't trust the King James Bible you have to trust the Book of Mormon even though there's nothing wrong with the King James Bible they admit it, it's just no good because it's old and it's faded and now we have to have 
uh, of Mormonism to I don't there's nothing in the Book of Mormon of any value whatsoever it's completely vain in every single thing that it says and teaches nevertheless that's the extreme in my opinion the extreme form of dispensationalism so now you got other dispensations that say well okay there's a thousand year reign of Christ that comes after he returns so this is this form of dispensationalism is that Jesus sets foot on earth and he reigns for a thousand years nobody ever talks about what happens when Jesus stops reigning uh, who takes over you know and while he's reigning uh, the suggestion the implication is that Jesus doesn't reign right now and I'm telling you if Jesus does not reign in your life right now how can you rightly say that you are saved and I think about that Jesus doesn't reign right now but he's gonna reign for a thousand years after he returns and then it's over he stops raining now there's a and within that teaching there's a lot of variances one and and that's what I'm saying that's what I keep saying is push these people on this idea do you have people unsaved people during this thousand year period after the return of Jesus having sex do you have saved people who are transformed into their glorified bodies who don't have sex? Talk about that, because that's important. Because we go, I mean, look, you go back to Genesis, it talks about be fruitful and multiply. What do you think that's that means? Grow garden? You think that's what that means? No, he he's talking about you have children have children have sex so we are okay there it is so we are in this world where we're having sex and we are having children as God commanded us there is coming a time when that will go away alright so for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are, are as the angels of God in heaven in the resurrection we're not having sex now that's another good question are you teaching that after you are resurrected you're still going to be having sex so it's a fair question. It's a great question, if you ask me. And it's an important question because you know, let's you know, don't be afraid of your doctrine. Just rather than echoing what other people are teaching, think about what it is that you're teaching. In First John chapter two, verse seventeen. I'm sorry, verse fifteen. Excuse me. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There is no more sex in the resurrection. All right. Now, I want, this is why it's so important. So you got this thousand year period after Jesus comes that you say Jesus is going to reign. Do you have a world of people having sex? It's a great question. It don't shy. What are you afraid of? If you're not willing to answer that, what are you afraid of? You're afraid your whole stinking doctrine is going to fall apart. So you're going to tell me that in this thousand year period, there are saved people 
who are transformed into their glorified bodies, are they having sex? No? Okay. Are you going to say there are unsaved people who are not transformed into a glorified body, but are just as we are right now? Are they having sex after the return of Jesus? Now, think about this. You have the return of Jesus, which clearly states that we will be, in a moment, in the uh, twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. And that the first the dead in Christ shall rise, and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is the resurrection. This is the end of the world. Are you saying the end of the world is only for us? Okay, I mean, think about it. Are you saying that the unsaved people are still going to be alive after we are set back down on earth? Now think about it. Are you teaching a thousand year reign where Jesus sets his foot on the Mount of Olives? After his return. Is that what you're teaching? That he's got his foot on the Mount of Olives and there are still unsaved people living after his return. Alright, so now, according to them, you have this period of time where there are unsaved people still having sex, still having children, and therefore, the end of the world did not come. For the unsaved, anyway. Now, what was the point of Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven and stating this is the end of the world? You get it? It doesn't make any sense. Is it the end of the world, or is it not the end of the world? When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, and we see this all throughout Scripture, is it the end of the world? That's what it says very clearly by the Lord himself in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. That when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. And what's it say in Revelation? Something about, behold, he comes with clouds. Is this the end of the world? Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. This is directly parallel with what we read in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. It's the same thing, fellows. It's the same, same thing. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then they shall, er, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. All right, what I just read in Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds. It's the same thing. Every eye shall see him. It's not a different event, fellas. It's the same thing. Same thing. We go to we go to Luke 21. It's going to tell us the same thing. He's coming in the clouds of heaven. Is it the end of the world? That's the question. If it's the end of the world, why are the unsaved people still living and still having sex and still having children? All right, that's now I want to, I just I have to make that clear. I have to hammer that point home to force everybody into this box where they say, "Okay, you're right." All right, so there won't be unsaved people. Now, once you get to that spot, once you get into that position where you admit there is no unsaved people, 
living after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are resurrected, lifted up, and we are changed in the twinkling of an eye. At, and then our enemy is gathered at our feet and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. Once you get to that point where you admit there are no more unsaved people living after the return of Jesus, after the whole thing is finished, right? We're lifted up, we're changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye, and our enemy is destroyed forever. Once you get to that point, this during and then you say okay well there's still a thousand year period all right so and this is what some people will tell you there's a thousand years of peace now we're making progress all right so what you're gonna say is there's a thousand years of peace after we're the after the return of Jesus okay so now the question is, are there unsaved people living after the return of Jesus? Again, it's the same thing. I hope you can pick up on this. I really do. So, yeah. Are you going to say, yeah, they're still unsaved people? Well, then you have to say they're having sex. You have to. That, that's what God commanded. Well, way back in Genesis 1 verse 28 God blessed them and said unto them be fruitful and multiply have sex have children and replenish the earth all right fill it up all right so you're back to this spot where you got unsaved people having sex living with saved people who are transformed into their glorified bodies and who are not having sex all right that's a tough spot to be in but think about it so for a thousand years you're gonna have unsaved people having sex saved people transformed but at the same time you're gonna say there's peace there's a thousand years of peace now has anybody ever been married and <laughs> has anybody ever had a boyfriend or a girlfriend you're not gonna have peace as long as you have marriage and sex alright there's gonna be jealousy there's gonna be resentment there's gonna be argument there's gonna be stress you can't have a thousand years you can't have can you even have a full day of peace in that state I don't know what do I know I don't know nothing but you're not gonna have a thousand years of peace that would mean that all these unsaved people never sin it's the only way it's possible you got a thousand years of unsaved people having sex what gay sex too I mean, talk about it seriously. Are there is there going to be bestiality? You know, having sex with donkeys and all that sort of stuff. And what's going on during this thousand years? How can you have a thousand years of peace, meanwhile, unsaved people living during that thousand years? Now, once I get you out of that, once I push you out of that box, okay. You met, yeah, you're right. Okay, so there aren't un unsaved people living during the thousand years. All right, once I get you to admit that, to understand that, to to accept that, that after the return of Jesus Christ, there are no more unsaved people. Once you finally get there, then the question is real easy. Why would there be a thousand years why everybody's saved everybody's peace uh, peaceful everybody's perfect and sinless there is no death no sorrow no crying why 
would there be a need for that to come to an end? Why? All right, let's say at the end of this thousand years of peace, after the return of Jesus, now you're going to say Satan is going to be loosed and he's going to gather together. He's going to deceive the nations and gather them together. But who's he going to gather together? Saved people? We, we already came to the conclusion that there cannot be unsaved people living after the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not possible. So the only thing you're left with are saved people. So are you saying that Satan is going to gather saved people to battle against God? It doesn't make any sense, fellas. Now, you have to go back and go against the Word of God and the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and say that there are going to be saved people living after Jesus comes in the clouds, but then they're going to lose their salvation. Now, if that's possible, then right now you're not saved. You cannot be truly saved unless you're saved forever. Unless you're saved for all eternity, forever and ever, and nothing can ever take that away, no matter what, until you get to that point, you're not truly saved. All right, and that then that goes completely against the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has promised us everlasting life if we believe in Him. And once He has chosen us, we are sealed, secure, sanctified, forever. Nothing can change that. So that right there blows away this idea that saved people are going to be unsaved what happens it's illogical well, okay so they're saved and they're changed into their glorified bodies and then they become unsaved what happens they start having sex again they go back to what they what we are now how does that happen where's that at in the bible this is all fairy tale stuff man it's not logical and it's not scriptural. All right, so you get one you get where I'm coming from. Now, if we just simply read Revelation 20 and believe what it says, we can see that that 1000 years is right now. Why is it a unique time period? Why is it a 1000 years? Very simple. Because it's when our Lord came to the earth. When baby Jesus was born, he came here and laid down his life for us. And now we are witnesses of him that are born of the Spirit of God. So he laid down his life. He died, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. And he has promised us that he will come back for us. And when he comes back for us, we will forever be with him and he will make all things new a new heaven a new earth no more pain no more sorrow no more suffering no more death no more sin whatsoever when he comes back it's the end of the world all right now uh, we go uh, we'll break this down a little bit and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus this could not be true before baby Jesus right this can only be during this time period of baby Jesus to the time of his return and for the Word of God in which had not worshiped the beast again when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven the beast is done away with forever. All right, neither his image, neither had received his mark. This this is only for this time period. 
that we're living in right now. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And notice that they live and reign. Not talking about Jesus reigning. Not talking about Jesus lives a thousand years. You know Jesus doesn't live a thousand years. How come nobody ever talks about that? You ever? I never thought about that. Well, it says lived and reigned. Why focused only on reign? Why not have a doctrine that says, well, Jesus lives a thousand years after he returns? I mean, if you're going to distort the Bible, why not get real funky? Right? Let's go to Revelation 1 again. Or, is it, yeah, it's Revelation 1, I think. Heck, I don't know. Somewhere in the Bible, let me see if I can cheat a little bit. And right there, verse 6. Revelation 1, verse 6. And has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now let's go to 2 Peter. Oops. Somewhere in the Bible, it says something. Let's see what it is. Oh, boy, I thought I thought it was spelled without the H. What do I know? Okay, 1 Peter. What did I say? 2 Peter. I have no idea what I'm talking about. 1 Peter 2. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood right now. We are a royal priesthood. Right now, we are priests of God. Right now. I mean, if you're not, how can you say that you're saved? If you're not a priest of God and of Christ right now, how? what are you? A child of the devil? And what options do you have, man? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Are you telling me right now the second death has power over you? It, then that destroys everything that Jesus ever taught. Have you never read the gospel? Think about John 11. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? What's he mean? You shall never die. That means the second death has no power over you. What is that verse that I'm thinking of here? I can't remember nothing. The will Rowan, the we would be dead. Yet well, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Think about that. The second death has no power over you once you are born of the Spirit of God. All right, think about it again. I mean, we could hammer this sucker home all day long. Think about this. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. When you are born of the Spirit of God, you shall never die. The second death has no power over you right now. Okay? So, when this time period that we're living in now is over from the time of baby Jesus to the time of his return and we are lifted up in the air to be with the Lord the first the dead in Christ and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them Satan is loosed out of his prison for what purpose to go out and deceive the nations to bring them together to gather them together to battle and then they are at our feet they are at our feet. Now this goes all the way back to Genesis 3, verse 15. 
I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Talking about Jesus. Jesus will stomp his heel on the head of the serpent. And that's exactly what we're reading here in Revelation 20, verse 9. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. This prophecy is all throughout the Bible. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. All right. All throughout the Bible. We read that in Psalm 110 also. Now, it's parallel. It's the same thing. This is a prophecy that is going to be fulfilled when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Behold, he comes with clouds. And we are lifted up to be with the Lord. And this, again, we can go to Revelation 3. Uh, and I particularly enjoy this one. Here, verse 9, it says, Behold, I make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Notice the reference of Satan, and then in Genesis 3, we saw, uh, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between her seed, uh, thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. All right, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Right, this is parallel with this. I will come and I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. That's when we're going to be up in the air and the Satan is going to gather together the elect at our feet. All right, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is all throughout the Bible. It's amazing, really. And that's the end of the world, man. That's the end of the world right there. That's when uh, sin is destroyed forever. All right, all wickedness, all evilness, all of it's shit gone forever and everything has changed everything will be new after that point all right so i hope you know I've, i went very thorough because it's very logical very simple and i hope somebody uh i hope the light turns on for somebody i really do because it's pretty amazing stuff and it's great to be able to read the bible and to understand it and the secret to understanding the Bible is faith. All right, just believe the Bible you hold in your hands, that's it. Stop believing people over the Word of God. The Word of God itself is powerful, very, very powerful. So, for Hebrews 4, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Very powerful. All right, so... <laughs> believe the Bible that you hold in your hands believe that it's from God because it is alright so I uh, appreciate that question RC I hope I hope uh, that made a lot of sense for you now Perjarn Mickelson probably said that all wrong uh, Revelation 11 to Revelation 13 5 talks about 42 months it's half of seven years and I you know I don't know if uh, I want to spend an hour going over this let me just simply say let me be a little bit smart alecky about it and say that 42 months is not seven years all right 42 months is not seven years I think you'd have to go about 84 months 
if I'm if my math is right in order to reach seven years all right then you would have to uh, establish this idea that it's the great tribulation all right uh, the whole 84 months that is right and not just the 42 months so you have to go um, all the way with that now I feel like if I go over this I'll have to explain Revelation 11 and Revelation 13 and the, get the proper context of what these are talking about now I was thinking there was something in here maybe it's Revelation 11 that would sort of help you I could it must be 11 or I'm not seeing it let's go to 11 all right let's go to 11 I think it is 11 now that I think about it and I'm probably not I'm probably just blind probably just blind can't so oh, right there it was hold on a second there it is right there in front of my face verse 11 and after three days and a half well three days and a half is well that's half within seven right we go back up where was the 42 months at um, right there but the court which is without the temple leave out measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall be or shall they tread underfoot forty and two months? That's not seven years. It's not talking about a seven year tribulation at all. So what do you do here? You got a thousand two hundred and three score days, you do the math on that, that's about forty two months. But that's in reference this is the forty two and the twelve hundred and thirty score days, you can't say the 42 months is the first half and then the 1260 days is the second half it doesn't work that way and then nor can you fit in the three and a half or the three days and a half uh, that doesn't that can't be the second half of the 42 months all right and this all stems back from Daniel 9 anyway and I spent a bunch of time on Daniel 9 it, they're making it very clear there's no seven year nothing in Daniel 9 and the fact the people that teach this idea they all say the Messiah is the Antichrist every one of them and you can talk to them personally and they'll tell you that's the Antichrist they believe the Messiah their Messiah is the Antichrist that's for what it really boils down to and then also uh, to believe that you also have to say that Jesus Christ did not put an end to sacrifice in other words his he laid down his life for nothing I mean that's really what it comes down to now if you if you want man you know I don't mind talking about it but it's just right now because I've spent you know the last hour talking about this other thing, uh, this Revelation 20. Um, if you, you if you want me to continue to talk about it, or maybe I'll talk about it tomorrow, just to give me a follow up if you're even paying attention. Either way, appreciate the comments, man. These are great questions, great comments. Uh, it challenged me. If I, and, you know, I, I want to be challenged. Uh, if you have a different opinion, share it. Let's talk about it. Let's reason one with another. Let's hear the whole matter all right what's that verse here let's listen let's hear the whole matter i don't know if that's even right let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear god and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man now if you have a different opinion i have a different opinion it doesn't mean we're both going to hell it just means we have an opportunity to talk about something and both of us have an opportunity to grow in the Word of God and to grow in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and really isn't that what it's all about as iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another's countenance or something to that effect 
Wouldn't it be something if I could remember anything? Boy, I'd be amazed with myself if I could remember one thing. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. That's what it is. All right, so anyways, appreciate these. Um, and uh, above everything, I want to be fair when I'm talking about these things. So if I'm not being fair, point that out first. And then if I, you have a different opinion, uh, please share it with me. Appreciate it as always. And have a great day. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. Enjoy it.